Hi everyone. So when we're doing physics, we often talk about a certain property that objects have, which is mass. Um, but we often use the word mass without thinking too deeply about what it actually means. Now, the interesting thing about this is when you go a little bit deeper, you conclude that there are actually two completely distinct ways to define what we mean by mass. And that's going to be the subject of this video. We're going to talk about why there are really two different types of mass, and we're going to finish by talking about why in practice it doesn't actually matter if you distinguish between the two types of mass, and why that's a very surprising fact. Now you'll notice that I've already put on the screen two well-known physics formulae that involve mass, and the first of these uh, says the resultant force equals an object's mass multiplied by its acceleration, or in other words the second derivative um, of its position. Now this is Newton's law in one of its forms, assuming that our object has a, uh, a constant mass. And this equation leads us to a certain interpretation of mass, um, which is that mass is resistance to acceleration, right? Because for a given resultant force F, uh, if we make the mass M larger, then the size of the, uh, the acceleration vector will get smaller. And so the more mass you have, the less acceleration you get for a given uh, applied force. So we arrive at the interpretation that um, mass is resistance to changes in motion. Now the other equation I've written over here is Newton's law of gravitation. Now this equation tells us about the strength of the gravitational force between objects of mass uh, capital M and lowercase m. I've split the, uh, the fractional part into a fraction um, and a constant just to emphasize that the fraction is the gravitational field strength, um, and that the whole thing is proportional to small m, which is the mass of the object that we're dealing with. Now, if we think about the meaning of this equation, it's saying that if we want to make our gravitational force stronger, there are two ways to do it. One is you increase the gravitational field strength, right, which can be done either by uh, increasing capital M or decreasing the distance, lowercase r, uh, or you increase the mass of the object that we're interested in, which is lowercase m. In other words, the strength of the gravitational force is directly proportional um, to an object's mass. A good analogy for this is in electrostatics. So Coulomb's law in electrostatics says that the strength of the electrostatic force is proportional to a certain property of an object which we call the charge. And Newton's law of gravitation is mathematically, well, it has the same mathematical form, but instead of charges, we have masses. And so you can think of, according to this equation, you can think of mass as being like a um, gravitational equivalent of charge, in that it's just a property that some types of particle have, which determines how much gravitational force they experience. Now this might not sound very strange so far, because we're all used to seeing an M in Newton's second law, and an M in Newton's law of gravitation. Um, but if you think about it, if you'd never seen either of these equations before, um, then it wouldn't be obvious that there was any connection between them at all, right? One is saying that mass is a quantity that measures resistance to changes in motion. The other is saying that mass is a quantity that determines the strength of a gravitational force on the object. Those two ideas don't really have anything to do with each other. And so if we want to be a little bit pedantic, we could um, introduce some new names for those two masses because they're different concepts. Now, the usual names to give them, we call the M in Newton's second law, M subscript I, which stands for inertial mass, because inertia um, generally refers to the concept of sort of resistance to changes in things. And uh, we could do a similar thing. We could call the M in the law of gravitation, M subscript G for gravitational mass, right? So you really have two distinct concepts of mass, the inertial mass and the gravitational mass. Now, as an example of how things would be if the inertial mass and the gravitational mass were indeed completely distinct quantities, let's consider the classic example physical system of the simple pendulum. And aside from just being a good physical system to, uh, to illustrate uh, ideas with, this is a good thing to be talking about because it's something that Newton himself spent uh, a lot of time doing experiments with. He used pendulums to sort of investigate the difference between inertial and gravitational mass. So we have the setup of um, a string or a rod of length L making an angle of theta to the vertical, and we have a bob at the end um, with a certain mass, and of course it has a gravitational mass and an inertial mass. Now if we want an equation of motion that describes how uh, 
the system evolves. We have to, of course, consider the forces. Well, there are other ways you could do Lagrangian mechanics if you wanted, um, for example, but let's stick to, to forces. Now, um, there is, of course, the weight acting down. And that's going to be m times g, where lowercase g is the gravitational field strength. But this is really m subscript g, right? The uh, gravitational mass. So that's pointing downwards. There'll be some kind of tension in the in the rod or string, um, pulling it up and to the left as well. So what we can do is resolve our forces um, in the radial and tangential directions, right? Remember this, the bob is really performing circular motion. So if we draw some local um, tangential and radial directions, there's a tangent to the path um, of the bob, and there is the, uh, the radial direction at 90 degrees to that. This angle here is, of course, theta, the same as the one up at the top. So if we resolve our forces uh, tangentially, well, the tension doesn't have any tangential component, it's purely radial. Um, and so the resultant force in the tangential direction is purely coming from the tangential component of the weight. The component of the weight um, from trigonometry is gonna be gravitational mass times G, that's the weight. And then we just times it by sine theta and give it a minus sign because it's tending to um, pull the pendulum bob back towards the center. And we're going to set that equal to the acceleration uh, multiplied by the inertial mass, right? So we've got mi, inertial mass over here. The linear acceleration, because it's moving in a circle, is going to be the radius of the circular motion, L, multiplied by the angular acceleration, theta double dot. So we've got our equation of motion, which we can then uh, rearrange. Now, the usual way of doing this is divide through by m, and the m is cancelled because there's one on both sides. But here, we're allowing mg and mi to be different. And so we end up with theta double dot, put everything on the same side, theta double dot plus uh, gravitational mass over inertial mass times gravitational field strength over L um, sine theta is equal to zero. So there's our equation of motion. So then we make the usual assumption that we're dealing with small angles. So if theta is much less than one in radians, then we can say that sine of theta is roughly the same as theta itself. And then you have the acceleration plus a constant um, times the angular displacement theta itself is equal to zero. That is the equation for simple harmonic motion. So we get simple harmonic motion regardless of whether the inertial and gravitational masses um, are the same. Now, what can we say about the simple harmonic motion? Um, well, the coefficient of theta or sort of sine theta in this case, which is approximately theta, the coefficient of that this um, combination of two fractions multiplied together, that is omega squared, where omega is the angular frequency of the SHM, right? So we can say that the omega squared value is mg over mi times g over L. And because the period of the oscillation is two pi over omega, um, we conclude that the period of oscillation is two pi times the square root of mi over mg times L over g. Now, of course, if we say that mi and mg are the same, then the mass ratio cancels and you get two pi root L over g, which is the well-known commonly used expression for the period of a pendulum. Remember, however, that in principle, inertial and gravitational mass don't have anything to do with each other, right? In just the same way that inertial mass and electric charge have nothing to do with each other. So it could be the case in principle that um, the ratio of inertial mass to gravitational mass depends on the type of material that your bob is made out of. And so this is exactly what Newton himself investigated. He took lots of different pendulums. Um, he filled their bobs um, with a lot of different materials, and then he swung them and uh, sort of uh, investigated the motion over a long period to see whether they stay in phase or not, right? Because if the ratio mi to mg varies between different materials, then each pendulum will have a slightly different period and they'll go out of phase if you, if you, even if you give them the same initial conditions, right? If they have slightly different periods. And after doing all the experiments with all these different pendulums, he didn't observe any difference in period. I think um, he was able to do it to an accuracy of a few parts in a thousand. In other words, he was able to say 
that the inertial and gravitational mass don't differ from each other by more than a few parts in a thousand. So the conclusion really, um, which has been supported to a very high degree of accuracy by more modern experiments, is that inertial and gravitational mass, although they're completely different concepts, always seem to be proportional to each other. And that's just a very strange coincidence. As far as I'm aware, we don't have any good explanation as to why that should be the case. And that's the reason why we don't distinguish between them usually, right? Because numerically, they're the same. And so we can just refer to a mass. But keep in mind that there's really these two um, distinct concepts. As a final point, uh, you may be thinking, well, they don't have to be the same. Mi over mg could be some constant. Maybe the inertial mass is always twice the gravitational mass. Um, now, it doesn't really matter, basically, whether mi over mg is 1 or some other constant. All that matters is that they're proportional to each other, because you can always just rescale your unit system um, and your fundamental constants um, in such a way that they are the same, right? So we've chosen our unit system, our definition of you know, what we mean by unit of force, and uh, you know the numerical value of uh, g, the gravitational constant, we've chosen those such that the inertial mass and gravitational mass come out to be the same. But the key point really is that they're proportional to each other, no matter how you define your system of units. So in my next video, I will have a bit more to say on this topic. I'll be talking about a more recent experiment that's been done to confirm that these two masses are really the same, called the Ertwersch experiment. Um, and I hope you'll uh, join me again soon to look at that. It's a topic that I find very interesting, basically because it's still something that we don't really have a good explanation for. Thanks for watching and see you soon.